Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle is a title developed and published by Chemco in 1989 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now before this game's release it seems Bugs Bunny, not to mention Looney Tunes in general, was having some serious trouble getting their faces slapped on a video game. This bewilders me. I mean what was the problem? It's Looney Tunes! In the early 80s there were two proposed almost finished games featuring Bugs and the game. One for the Atari 2600 simply called Bugs Bunny, and then there was a game called Looney Tunes Hotel for the 5200. In Looney Tunes Hotel you play as Bugs and your objective was to close all the doors while avoiding bombs and shit left by unidentifiable Looney Tunes characters. So it was basically Hotel Mario more than a decade early. Looks are deceiving when Koopas are involved. But regardless, these were both cancelled for unknown reasons. So surprisingly, this was the very first ever video game to feature the legendary Warner Brother character. And you'd think such a video game debut could garner maybe a more worthy game, or at least something unique based off the license and its history, but instead, for better or worse, this is what we got. Basically a maze puzzle based simple strategy game. And it is what it is, but it's a game that's been relentlessly bashed in recent years, and the reality is, it's not a bad game, and in my opinion is much better, I be it very different than Bugs' follow-up the following year, titled Bugs Bunny's Birthday Blowout. But I'm only reviewing one game today, so I'm going to try to avoid even getting into that, as they are completely different games and different genres, really. But both being based off the Looney Tunes license and being the only two games to appear on the same video game system, I feel they often unfairly get compared. Regardless, the license isn't the point, and not to be whittle or cheapen Bugs' debut here, but at the end of the day, it's just a face slapped onto a game that could have been anything, really. In fact, what a lot of people may not know is this wasn't even a originally a Bugs Bunny game. In Japan it was released as Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit. Yeah, fucking Roger Rabbit. Fucking Roger Rabbit. Now you might have to ask yourself the question, is this game better or worse than the Roger Rabbit we got in the US? Suppose it's debatable, but that's another subject. He likes it. He likes it. Anyway, so around the same time in the US, the shit rainbow had already obtained the rights for a Roger Rabbit game, and with developer Rare released Who Framed Roger Rabbit the same year, so of course that could be a little bit of an issue. I mean, we couldn't have two games based off the same licensed movie, could we? Especially not in the same year, no. But due to the situation, I feel Bugs as a character maybe got the short end of the carrot on this one. Okay, Smokey, roll him. So Crazy Castle was basically a sprite swap job in the US and the ending was changed. The US ending isn't as good as the one in Japan, but whatever. So Roger's hearts were replaced by carrots and the characters like weasels, penguins, and that big ape dude from Who Framed Roger Rabbit were swapped to Looney Tunes characters. Hey, wabbit's a wabbit, so no big loss and it was a pretty easy painless swap for the designers. So for those of you unfamiliar, all you need to know is this is a puzzle strategy game that basically takes and shuffles elements from games before it. The one game that comes to mind is a 1983 game that was popular and released on every vintage computer system in the mid 80s called Load Runner. Here's the 1987 NES version. In Load Runner, your objective is to get all the gold in a level, avoiding enemies while you traverse a stage. The catch is you can't jump, and you often have to exploit the enemy's AI to pass or defeat them so you can get around them. If you die, you lose a life and start the level over. But if you're successful in getting all the gold, you are automatically rewarded with an extra life before going to the next level. This does pretty much sum up Crazy Castle. Replace the gold with carrots, maybe add a bit of salt and pepper from games like Pac-Man or Burger time, and that's Crazy Castle, basically a poor man's kid-friendly version of a modified Load Runner. Now that doesn't automatically make it a bad game, as the NES version of Load Runner isn't some holy masterpiece or anything, and Crazy Castle definitely has its own vibe and feel, but I mean maybe it would have been more appropriate if they had just called the game Road Runner, as it has a staggering amount of parallels and also it rhymes. So you start the game out and Bugs busts out behind the brick wall. What's with the the? Often the game's referred to as Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle or simply Crazy Castle. Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle. Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle. Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle. Crazy Castle? Crazy Castle. But the actual title was The Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle? Now I'm not a grammatically correct motherfucker, but that doesn't sound grammatically correct to me. What were they trying to say? Bugs Bunny and the Crazy Castle? Bugs Bunny in the Crazy Castle? The Crazy Castle featuring Bugs Bunny? Any of those would make more sense if they have to put the word THE in there. That's Bugs Bunny. I have never heard anyone refer to him as THE Bugs Bunny. The, the Bug Bugs Bunny. Bunny. And shit, looking at it closely now, they did the same thing with Bugs Bunny's birthday blowout. Its actual correct title is THE Bugs Bunny's birthday blowout. Really? The Bugs Bunny? It sounds so fucking generic. So I don't know what they were thinking and sorry to make a big deal out of it, but I mean, come on. Anyway. 
So the story ain't shit and doesn't need to be, but let me give it to you anyway. It's basically another quest for pussy game like more or less all the NES games at the time. And well, let's just read from the manual for content here. Welcome to Crazy Castle. Listen up, Doc. It's up to you to guide me, Bugs Bunny, through the castle and rescue Honey Bunny. But don't think it's gonna be easy. Those rascals Daffy Duck, Sylvester, Wiley Coyote, and Yosemite Sam have captured Honey Bunny and have her hidden deep within the castle. Along the way, we have to collect all the carrots while avoiding those rascals. Okay, Doc, let's get going. Okay, Doc. Sounds good, but who the fuck is Honey Bunny? Once in a while, you were drag queening it out, but I don't remember this dame you're after. Usually... I play the female love interest. Maybe I shouldn't even fucking go here, but I'm an idiot, so I will briefly, because god damn it, if you're gonna put a story in a game, I wanna know what we're fighting for, especially if this fucking piece of cotton tail is replacing this one. So Honey Bunny was a character not known to any of us who grew up with the cartoon reruns, as she was developed after the animation studio closed. Yes, this was the only Looney Tunes character never to be animated, but she made a name for herself in the comics, as well as merchandise and believe it or not amusement park theater performances through the 70s and 80s. In the comics, she started off the giggly girly type, but quickly matured into the most level-headed sane member of the Looney Tunes gang. Any of you fucking tricks move, and I'll execute every motherfucking last one of you! Her eventual look and even personality could be the early inspiration for what would later become Babs Bunny in the Tiny Toons series. Guess she was a favorite among fans of the comics and stuff, who couldn't wait to see her finally hit the screen in a new animated movie that was first proposed in the early 90s, where she was set to be Bugs' female counterpart. This proposed movie eventually became Space Jam, but Honey Bunny's sweet, innocent persona was literally killed off, murdered by producers for this new sexed up wabbit who would become Lola Bunny when she hit the big screen in Space Jam, marking the end for sweet little Honey Bunny, obliterating her memory from the conscious minds of all the people on the planet forever, virtually lost and forgotten for all time, except for this little piece of evidence of her existence left in a 20th century game called the Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle. <laughs> So as far as the game is concerned, really there's not a lot to say. The game never gets too over the top crazy, but there are some moments of craziness, I guess. Enough to bear the name, even if just barely. So you got Sylvester's as your main most common enemies, along with your Riley Coyotes, Daffy Ducks, and Yosemite Sam's. It's sort of a generic use of Looney Tunes characters with a grand total of seven enemy types, and four of them are different versions of Sylvester, two of which are both black but have a slight AI adjustment. I guess the fact that they were originally Roger Rabbit Weasels is the only reason I can see why there would be four variations of the same character. While sure they are portrayed well enough, they aren't very Sylvester-like. If anything, they act like zombies. I mean, look at them. They're walking around like they want my rabbit brain in a stereotypical arms-out Frankenstein monster pose. Hey, Frankenstein. Again, you have to use this to your advantage and learn to exploit them sometimes. For example, this fucker above me right now, I need him out of the way, so hey, I'll just walk into this wall for a bit and watch him pass on by. Now where'd that skunk of a rabbit go? Of the other three enemy types, both Yosemite Sam and Wily are exactly the same. Daffy has a small AI tweak which makes him more controllable but also a bit more unpredictable than the other two. Go away, I don't want anything from you! Scram! But he's basically the same too, as the three characters who aren't Sylvester's won't use passageways, pipes, or stairs, and are basically either always patrolling or walking towards bugs, or set up in a position in the level where they can be a nuisance. Come on! Quit stalling! You notice little things like the pink Sylvester's only move when you move, and the green Sylvester's you can't really control and will always go towards your direction. But he's a dumbass. I mean, look at him, he'll follow you around. If you're above him, he'll go up. If you're below him, he'll go down. But if there's a wall between you, he doesn't give a fuck. He just walks right into it and turns around. If you're on the same floor, he'll follow you, but if there's a pipe or door, he'll usually go up it just for shits and giggles, oh, I guess. Oh, come on! Stand still! How do you expect me to grasp you when you jump around like a flea on a hot brick? Oh, I suppose you stand still? Okay, pretty cat, I stand still. Such a dumbass. As far as defense for bugs, you have a few items at your disposal. Most common is the boxing glove, which is usually the most useful. It can be thrown at enemies, but if you miss them, you can re-pick it up or even leave it somewhere else if you want to pick it up later. Which is nice, but it's a double-edged sword. It leaves plenty of room for error, keeping the game on the easier side for the most part. And unlike Pac-Man or Load Runner, defeated enemies don't come back. Some levels may have more than one boxing glove, and you can actually carry both in your inventory. I often find that you don't even really need them, but in some specific stages, enemies will need to be taken out to progress. There's also these pushable items like the safe crate bucket and the rare 10 ton anvil. Oh, 
the only difference between the items are the amount of spaces they move. As the game's set up more on a grid of like spaces, it's not like a Mario game where you can move freely through a side-scrolling world. They all accomplish the same thing, but are worth different points when you take out an enemy with them. The points really don't matter, and it's a shame that they're very underutilized in this game. The other two items are the Magic Carrot Juice, which makes you invincible for around 5 seconds and you can take out as many enemies as you want Pac-Man style while under the influence of this Magic Juice. The last item isn't really an item, but it shows up a few times throughout the game. It's this no carrot sign. Um, it's easily avoidable, but if you touch it, I guess you die and go to this special stage. These special stages are usually actually crazy. In fact, they're the most crazy levels in the game. If you beat them, you get three extra lives and go on to the next level. Die and you go back three levels. So it's a gamble, but three levels back isn't the end of the world. There's not much satisfaction in the three lives either, especially if you're a more experienced gamer. The controls are pretty simple and you get used to them. My only gripe really is when you fall from high up, you'll take one extra step forward in the direction you're facing when you land. I guess it's just part of the game's design, but it can be trouble in certain places. Like here I fall and shit, because I have to take one extra step upon landing, I go down here, where I don't want to be, and damn, looks like I'm fucked. Well, I got lucky. I thought I was rabbit stew for a second there. <laughs> There's a few other little issues, but it could be a lot worse. I'm glad you can grab stairs mid-fall and things like that. In other defenses, you can pull a what's up doc on enemies by going through pipes or doorways as they enter or leave them. What's up doc? Uh, what's up doc? Uh, what's up doc? And I guess that's a pretty important strategy worth noting. You do get a password after every level, and you and I can appreciate the simple four digits of this password. It sure beats the password system for a game like the US Roger Rabbit. However, if you need to take a break at some point during the NES version 60 levels, for me, I say fuck writing down any of these passwords. All these passwords are pretty much useless at the end of the day, as you only really need to know one. YTKX. This password takes you to level 60, but it gives you free range to pick any level of your choosing by pressing down or up on the D-pad. So that's really the only password you really need to remember and you can simply just pick the level where you left off. Save some ink. Save some trees. Now you gotta wonder how one would figure out this special secret password back in the day without the internets or the Nintendo power telling you. Well they stuck it right there on the back of the fucking box for one thing. Yeah, there it is in one of the screenshots on the back of the box right next to it telling you to get honey, remember the secret passwords. Well I guess it's not so much of a secret password as they decided to take the hiding in plain sight approach. So as far as passwords, just YTKX, that's all you need to know. Yeah, simple. So before wrapping this up, I'd like to talk about the game's level design and difficulty. First off, this game's difficulty is kind of all over the place. Usually with games like this, the difficulty ramps up gradually till the end. And that's usually just like simple good game design, right? I mean, a game will start off easy enough and it ramps up the further you get. But this game's a little bipolar. Even after a series of somewhat difficult levels, it will suddenly throw you into a level that's easier than the opening first level. I don't get it. Why? I guess they kind of just random ordered this shit. It's not a game-breaking issue, but it's a little what the fuck. Regardless in general, it's a pretty relaxing, simple, easy game that for me isn't as mind-numbingly simple and boring as its pseudo-sequel which is pretty much made for babies. Can you imagine anybody acting like that? You know? I think the poor guy's screwy. So for my short kind of walkthrough segment of the game, I'll just pick a few levels that stood out to me, as it'd be pointless to go through each level of a game of this nature, so let's just dive into a few that I've selected here. So this is level 26. For me, this was the first level during one of my playthroughs where I had to question if the game was broken. Like after a few tries, I was somewhat stumped and had to ask myself whether to take this review in a more negative territory. However, thankfully I figured it out, or at least the solution that works for me. It's actually a very basic stage with only two enemies, a plain black, gray, Sylvester, and a Daffy Duck. This is where I learned the hard way that Daffy can be a bit trickier than the other enemies to manipulate. So, yeah, I was probably overthinking it and this footage is a little embarrassing, but it should give you an idea of my experience. At first I tried to simply pass him as I had no idea what was beyond him. I guess that was a bad idea. But now seeing the whole stage I thought, hey, I could just okie doke him and maybe sneak by him. It seems pretty tight, but there's other levels where I had to time things just right to sneak past other frenemies before. But again, this wasn't happening. Next attempt, I really tried luring him out, thinking I could treat him like a Sylvester, but he was being daffy on me, and out of desperation, I tried once more to sneak past him. Yeah. Then this one attempt, I went around collecting the easily attainable carrots, minding my own fucking business, and Daffy just randomly seemed in the mood to pass me by, so I took advantage and beat the level. Now normally that would be good enough, move on, but this wasn't the first time I did this approach and I had no idea what I had done differently, so pff, fucking being me, I had to know, I mean I'm not going through that shit ever again. So I backtracked and did the stage again and this time did something that makes a lot of sense, I walked into the wall, and quickly he was over here. It didn't work out but I saw it as a key for success. So the moral of the story, level 26, grab a couple of your carrots and go up and walk into the wall here and don't stop till he's clear to pass, collect your carrots and move on. It's easy. Easy like Sunday morning. 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 Easy like Sunday
Level 14 and 19 and shit, 48 and a few others I was considering talking about, but there's really nothing to say. It's just a good example of stages where you have to sometimes just wait it out and observe, take your time. It's also a good example where you need to feel out the stages before you know what's going on, as this is another pretty big flaw that I think is worth mentioning. Some levels often like these pipe stages are often more left to right in nature, but you still need to walk the stage to see everything. And that's fine, but other stages, especially these levels that are more vertically based, it's a bit of an issue, as you'll be traversing a lot more up and down space and you really don't know what's going on above or below you, which can lead to death. Now one thing Load Runner and other puzzle based collectathon type games will often do is before throwing you into the action is give you a preview of the stage. Again going back to Load Runner, here's a level, here's what it looks like, here's the obstacles and all the gold. For another example, here's a game like Boulder Dash, same sort of thing, it gives you the layout and a second to plan your approach for a level. Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle doesn't do this, so often you have to die just getting your bearings, seeing what enemies are facing and where carrots are located. This issue could have been totally avoided if they had ripped off these other games by giving you a quick preview. Maybe it would have made the game more easy, or maybe I should look at it as a nice way of getting rid of some of these excess lives you keep getting, but I don't know, I think this could have been handled better, and it would have been worth the effort to put this in there. Here's level 55, another level that takes trial and error. Without getting into it and being overly in-depth, what it comes down to is there's a pink Sylvester here that makes his way to the top and groups up with more Sylvesters, and if he gets up there before you, you're screwed. So after a few trials, I finally came to the realization that this level's a race. You have to ignore these carrots and get your ass to the top before this pink one does and make this carrot over here your number one priority, along with this one through this pipe here. Again, I don't think this level's flawed or broken, it's just a good 80% of the levels aren't like this. I could go on, but once you know how to manipulate enemies if you have to, and that some stages take some patience and observation, some rare stages weapons should be used for certain enemies, and that some levels you have to plan out getting certain carrots in a better order, that's pretty much all the permutations the level may contain, and the game won't send too much away that's not par for the course, at least not with these types of games. I do have to mention these special stages briefly though. While a couple of them are fun, I suppose, and even crazy, mainly they're just a pain in the ass. This first one with all the pipes is, uh, mad but doable, but Daffy on the bottom is a bit of a gamble when coming back down to grab another pipe. What's up, duck? These pipes also take forever, which can get old quick if you've done the stage a few times. Pretty much take all the pipes at least once, and then you may have to repeat a couple to get any carrots missed or to get around Daffy. It's kind of an interesting stage worth experiencing, but again, most of these stages are more trouble than they're worth. A good example of this is a special stage via stage 40, and I dare you to beat it. I mean, like most of these no carrot stages, I had to skip it via my playthroughs, and when I went back to check it out, well, let's just say save states were my best friend. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not that I used them to beat the level per se. Per se. And and in my real playthroughs, I would just skip these by not touching the no carrot sign. But like a good three of the four special stages like this, if you actually try to beat this one, you're gonna die. A lot. So yeah, I had to use save states because again, failure on a level like this takes you back three stages. I'm not gonna keep repeating three stages over and over again to figure this shit out. So saving was my only sane option. Don't judge me. So here's the layout, you start here, there's nowhere else to go but down, and what's waiting for you down there but a Sylvester? Of course, you didn't know! The game doesn't show you a level preview, but you should have known. What the fuck? Even after a few attempts, there's a good chance you'll face the same result. You can wait a few seconds longer before blind falling, and that might save you, but probably not. So I use the combination, I wait a few seconds longer than natural, but when I'm falling, I'm pressing right on the d-pad as if I'm walking into a wall. Even when you're falling, it still has to affect like you're walking, and now at least there's a good chance you might make this fall and live. Now there's plenty of Sylvester's, but the main thing is the Sam and Wily e. Coyote. Now you could go up and get these carrots and then fall back down and deal with that shit again, or try to get these carrots now. Regardless, it takes for fucking ever and some luck. Sam is really unpredictable and you have barely enough time to get the carrot on this side, then you have to repeat it for the other side. It's probably easiest if you make one of these the last carrots you get, just in case you get trapped by Sam. Still, you have to get past Wily and it's often the same deal. You often have to what's up dock him fucking constantly because of Sam up here and hope you don't bump into either one. Not to mention a Sylvester might even get in the fucking mix. Then grab the carrot and wait for the chance to grab one of these other ones if you haven't gotten already. At the end of the day, this level as well as all these special levels should be skipped. They're the hardest levels in the game, hands down, but for the wrong reasons. Some of them like this one don't even have any weapons, and it's like, you have to just do it freaking perfectly. Fuck these special stages. I mean, I'm all for a good challenge and everything, but these fucking levels take it a little far. Like, what the fuck's going on here? So in conclusion, is the Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle a bad game? No, absolutely not. It's not for everyone, but it doesn't really deserve any of the hate it's gotten. Sure, there's not much to it, and what you see is what you get, but that's often what you got from NES titles in 1989. It definitely could have been more inspired, but it's a fairly competent puzzle-based collect-a-thon game that's kid-friendly and it's the type of game that your mom or non-gamer dad could have played and enjoyed while still retaining enough challenge to not completely bore the average gamer of the era. That being said, it's kind of a niche genre that doesn't necessarily fit the Bugs Bunny character, but more on that in a minute. Now, if you really have an itch to play a game 
something like this, I'd say give it a shot. But there's probably other games I'd recommend over this one. Games like Load Runner, Boulder Dash would be worth checking out, and while not being exactly the same sort of game, games like Tecmo's Fire and Ice, Mighty Bomb Jank, or even titles like Kiko Cubicle and Lolo Games, or even Wrecking Crew or something like the original Japanese only Goonies might scratch that itch if you're ever in the mood to play an arcade ish sort of game or something in the same sort of vein. Anyway, I think I prefer Crazy Castle over a few of those titles, but you get what I'm saying. My biggest bitch is this was arguably the best Bugs Bunny game of the era, and that's bullshit. He's an iconic character that deserved much better than this, and it wasn't originally even his game. Regardless, it didn't even really fit either of these characters. I mean, say what you will about the LJN's Roger Rabbit, but at least it was a better fit for his likeness, and Bugs deserves similar treatment. Now, sure, Bugs' birthday sequel from a design perspective was a step in the right direction, but what environment are we in here? Outside of the characters, there's nothing that screams Looney Tunes to me as far as the setting here. Now, again, it's not a bad game, but, you know, I'm not gonna say it's a great game, but it's surprising how this fucker spawned as many sequels as it did. And one thing you should take from the AVGN's infamous review of this game was, God damn, why did they keep making these? I mean, I can only speculate, but probably due to its easy premise, it must have been really easy to program, and due to its license profile and G rating, it must have sold decently enough to make a profit. But you know, like James implied, the only real crazy thing about it was it went this far. However, one thing I would have liked James to have covered that maybe he overlooked as he was too busy fighting rabbits in costumes was there were still more of these games than even he mentioned. At least sort of. I mean, so many of them often took other names in other countries, probably the cover of the fact that there were so many made, and I can't blame him. I mean, it's fucking embarrassing. Mega Man, sure, maybe it was milked in some people's eyes, but compared to this shit, you really can't complain. I mean, in Japan, these were often called Mickey Mouse games, which makes this one of the only series I can think of to be split among so many fucking characters. But wait, in Europe, one of these games got a release as a Garfield game, titled Garfield's Labyrinth. Really? Now that's four fucking cartoon characters! Was Garfield more popular in Europe over Mickey Mouse, Roger, or Bugs? I don't know, but this shit is getting fucking ridiculous. And here's the final kicker, just to make this go into more redundant insanity. <laughs> this Game Boy title that was Garfield in Europe and Mickey fucking Mouse 4 in Japan also got a release here in America. As well, I don't know, take a guess. Mm, was it Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle 4? Was that a Warty Woodpecker game? No, it wasn't. It was the real Ghostbusters. The real Ghostbusters. Now, North America got 10 more levels than the other countries' versions, but who gives? a shit. The real Ghostbusters on Game Boy in North America was a crazy castle game? Yeah. yeah, real doesn't even belong in this title out of principle at this point. I mean, there are no words. It's pretty impressive yet crazy insane or insane crazy to think all this spawned from this one first fucking game, considering it's really nothing more than a simple average strategy type game that had a serious identity crisis going on the more you look at it, but I digress there, so sorry, let's finish this bitch up. Now, I haven't played every Bugs Bunny game, but it wasn't until arguably the PS1 era that he got a few decent titles. I mean, still it seems there was never just an awesome, widely acclaimed game, but at least these two I guess were decent for their time, as up until then they were all pretty much cash-ins, and this includes all the Looney Tunes licensed games in general, which there were like a numerous amount of, and they were often all half ass kind of games, but sticking to bugs, even his SNES debut, which had a fucking cover on Nintendo Power and shit, graphically it was beautiful, and unlike Birthday Blowout, it definitely had the right environmental elements, and it's more of what I would have liked to have seen from this character in the first place, but you play it and it's like, what the fuck, it's so hard and frustrating, it has such uninspired gameplay that I'd rather play Crazy Castle any day. Now, the original Game Boy version was decent at the time if you wanted some The Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle action on the go, and maybe it sold better than the NES version, hence all the sequels being handheld based, but I don't think it's a better game. There's 80 levels instead of 60, but I don't know, 60's enough. It has the same music, but in shorter loops, but also has a couple extra tracks, but these new tracks suck and I'm glad aren't in the NES version. I'll take less music with longer loops, missing this goofy Mickey Mouse Club sounding song, and this other tune that's good, it just isn't really as fitting as the other jazzy, upbeat type tunes in the NES version, which I'm actually a fan of. Also, the levels are completely different. I don't know if that's good or bad. However, the passwords are the same, and interesting, the last 20 levels not included in the NES version will work, taking you to these glitched out, unplayable levels. Again, these are all unplayable, puke looking stages unless you're on certain drugs, but I suggest you go outside and maybe take a walk if you're doing those types of activities. So, anyway, that's all I've got to say. Thanks for watching and have a good day. There's not much to say about those games. Can't help it. I'm a greedy slob. It's my hobby. Speaking of toys, you know all those mugs and t shirts and lunch boxes that I pitches on them. Yeah? You uh, ever see any money from all that stuff? <laughs> Not a cent. Hmm. Me neither. <sighs> it's a crying shame. We gotta get new agents. We're getting screwed. Game's over. I'm out of here. Wait a minute, you little cheater. You're not going anywhere until you tell me what a quickie bow is. No, no, no. Oh, my God.